Hello, everyone. This is Bruce Vandell with Complete College America. I want to thank you all for joining us today for today's webinar on some exciting uh, new research uh, on the effectiveness of co-requisite support. Um, uh, as you all know, Complete College America has identified co-requisite support as one of our key game changers, and we're thrilled to see the progress that's happening in the field. Um, however, earlier this summer, Lexa Logue, who's one of our panelists today, wrote a piece for Inside Higher Ed, sort of asking the question why more people aren't adopting co-requisite support, given the, all the evidence we're seeing in the field to include some new research that she and her colleagues have been, uh, have, uh, been uh, pursuing at the City University of New York. And so we're very fortunate today to have her, her and uh, Daniel Douglas and Mary Watanabe from the CUNY system present some very exciting research. Uh, so uh, we're gonna get to them in just a second. I wanna give you a couple of sort of housekeeping items. We are gonna have some time for Q&A towards the end. And if you look at uh, your uh, display for the webinar, you will see a Q&A feature that you can utilize. So we wanna make sure that you can ask your questions, but please use that feature as sort of a chat feature. We won't be doing any kind of audio Q&A we will just be moderating the questions that you provide there. The second thing is I want you to, if you hear something exciting or interesting during this webinar, feel free to use our hashtag Corec Works. This is where we've been posting all things co-requisite uh, on Twitter. And if you see and hear something, or if you have a story to tell um, or an experience to share about your own efforts to implement co-requisite, we'd love to hear about them there. Um, so what we're going to do is for the next few minutes hear from Lexa Logue, Daniel Douglas, and Mary Watanabe, who are all going to present this very, very exciting research. And so with no, fur with, uh, with, uh, just with no further ado, let's go ahead and pass it off to Lexa Logue. Thank you, Bruce, very, very much. We're so happy to be here to be able to do this webinar today, um, which I guess is afternoon for some people and morning for others. Um, and I'm very happy to be here with, as you said, uh, Dan Douglas and Mari Watanabe Rose, who are uh, my colleagues in this research. You could have the next slide. And this research that we're gonna be talking about has been supported by the Spencer Foundation and also by the City University of New York, CUNY, which we're very, very grateful for their support. We're gonna be talking about the three-year effects of co-requisite remediation with college-level statistics that we've been working on. So if I could have the next slide. Here we go. So this presentation is about our randomized controlled trial investigating the effects of co-requisite math remediation on student success. Uh, the, Initial research was published in 2016 in Educational Evaluation and Policy Analysis. That paper looked at the effects on performance of CUNY students in associate degree programs through one year after the intervention. But now we also have some three-year follow-up data, including graduation rates, that we're gonna be telling you about today. Now, first though, I'd like to give you a little bit of information about CUNY. So you have some context about that, where the experiment was done. CUNY has seven community colleges that have about 100,000 students. And those students, 68% uh, are black or Hispanic, 39% born outside the US, 41% have a first language other than English, 52% first generation college students, and 65% Pell Grant recipients. So that gives you some idea of the population that we're working with in this experiment. Okay, so now some, a little bit of information and context and background on remediation, particularly math remediation. The theory is that remedial courses prepare unprepared students for college level work. That's what's supposed to happen traditionally, but the actual results of traditional remedial courses is that the course pass rates are very low. In addition, the persistence and graduation rates of students who are assigned to these courses are very low. Uh, the financial aid of these students can be depleted because they have to pay for these courses, but they don't have any college level credits 
And so sometimes by the time one of these students uh, reaches the end of their bachelor's degree program, they've run out of financial aid before they actually finish. And this also is the, it's also the case that the student loan default rate can be very high among these students because they're often not completing their degrees and so they don't have the opportunity to earn a better salary that comes with a degree. And some people have also said that the civil rights of these students are being violated. The reason for that is that students who are from underrepresented groups and who are from families that have limited financial resources are more likely to be assigned to remediation. But once they are, there is uh, very little chance that they're actually going to make it through remediation, traditional remediation, and be able to graduate. Okay, uh, so here, this is a diagram that was done by the Community College Research Center, which does, has done really outstanding work on this, which illustrates uh, what happens with traditional remedial math. This is a diagram of a uh, situation in which there were three levels of remedial math. And what this diagram shows is that of 64,000, almost 64,000 students who were assigned to three level, levels of remedial math, only 11% of them actually ended up passing a gatekeeper math course, in other words, a college level math course, at the end of this sequence. The reason for that, as you can see from this diagram, is that students are being lost, both because they don't pass the individual courses, which in this case, there are three levels of remedial math, but also because they don't enroll in the next course after having finished one level of this three level progression here. And I want to add as um, we may talk about later, this, the situation is actually a little bit worse than what is shown in this diagram because this is assuming that all students who are assigned to remedial math start remedial math. And we know both from research at the Community College Research Center and from our own research that many students who are assigned to remedial math never even start the first course. So there should actually be another exit point here at the very, to the far left of this diagram. All right, so what's the alternative? An alternative that we're gonna be talking about today is co-requisite remediation. And that is remediation in which a student is assigned, instead of being assigned to a remedial course, a student is assigned to a college level course with extra help. And there's been a great deal of data that support co-requisite remediation. It has been shown successful with college level courses in chemistry, math, reading, sociology, and writing. And these are just some of the citations of that work. All right, but people have said that those data that I just cited to you don't prove that co-requisite remediation is better. They have said that these data are primarily descriptive. They don't involve controlled studies. The students in the co-requisite courses and the faculty teaching them may not be the same as in traditional remedial courses. In other words, perhaps the students who end up in the co-requisite courses and the faculty who end up teaching those co-requisite courses are not our better or worse or whatever, better in this case, I guess, than the students and faculty who teach the remedial courses. And so people have said um, that even with extra help, um, if I could have the next point, even with extra help, these students can't pass college level courses. And now to describe what we did in our randomized controlled trial, I'll pass it off to my colleague, Mari. Thank you, Exa. Uh, do I have uh, control for the slides or? No, so, okay, thank you. So I'm gonna talk about the uh, randomized controlled trial we conducted in fall 2013. Um, in summer 2013, we recruited 907 students at three CUNY community colleges. 
And these students were all assisted needing elementary algebra and were uh, non-STEM majors, meaning uh, their majors did not require college algebra. So these 907 students were randomly assigned into these three groups. The first one is, the first one is, um, <laughs> Okay, uh, group EA, uh, these students took traditional remedial elementary algebra, zero credit. So these students took the courses they were supposed to take. So business as usual. So this is a control group. The second group is group EAWS. Oh, do I have control? So these students took traditional remedial elementary algebra, the same courses group A students took with additional weekly workshop. And the third group is group STAT WS. These students took introductory college level statistics with a weekly workshop. So this is the co-requisite remediation group. Um, all right, some uh, details about the methodology. So as I mentioned, these students were recruited and randomly assigned into these groups in summer 13 and the implementation period was for 13. And additional support given to the EAWS and STATWS students and workshops. They were two hours per week and led by students, undergraduate students, and those students were recruited, trained, and supervised by us and also by the instructors teaching those sections. So essentially, these workshops were peer-led. And uh, there were three colleges, as I mentioned, at each of which four instructors were recruited. And uh, each instructor taught three sections and one section of each group. So instructors were all counterbalanced across the three groups. Okay, so we collected many data, uh, quantitative data, qualitative data, during and after the implementation, in addition to the course pass rate and credit accumulation and so on. And here are some of what we found. Uh, first, group EAWS students had the highest rate of summer melt, meaning that uh, these students recruited, you know, they came to the summer orient student orientation and they signed up for the experiment, but some of them didn't start their assigned uh, courses. And for EAWS group, the attrition rate was the highest, statistically significantly higher than the, the, the other two groups. So this is just a speculation at this point, but uh, remember EAWS students, you know, they had this business as usual, zero credit course. In addition to that, they had two hour workshops. So this addition, you know, additional commitment may have decreased EAWS students motivation. And also, uh, Statewide students' attendance rate for the uh, workshops, that was much higher, higher than EAWS students. It was statistically higher as well. And lastly, student, uh, Statewide students, uh, we conducted a survey, end of the semester survey, and it showed that Statewide students were more likely to form their own study groups outside class meetings or workshops, you know, their own study groups than the other two groups. So now, some student performance outcomes. So these are course, course pass rates in 413. Uh, we're showing only EA and ZWS numbers because uh, remember, EAWS students, you know, attrition rate was statistically higher than these two groups. So we're showing these, just these groups. EA students' pass rate was 39%. Well, that WS students' course pass rate was 56%. And so the probability of passing uh, are higher 
is higher for STAT-WS, no matter where the students are on the spectrum of COMPASS scores. COMPASS exam, you know, we, we would use this as a placement exam back in fall 2013. So this shows that all students, no matter what uh, their placement test scores were, uh, correct, correct remediation could be beneficial. So looking at these data, some people may argue that uh, the STAT students, STAT W students only did better because instructors might have been easier on them. And also um, because STAT W students never took elementary algebra, some might say that they won't do well in future courses. So we looked at credit accumulation uh, by one year after the experiment. And these numbers do, do not include stats courses students took in 413. For EA students, the credits were 16, uh, accumulated credits were 16, 16 credits, while stat WS students, the number was 19. So this shows that well, although students, staff students didn't take elementary algebra, they just took other courses and passed, it, uh, at least with, uh, within the next couple of semesters. What about the one year math completion, math gateway completion rates? So this uh, graph shows that uh, the lighter gray areas so they show the uh, gateway math course completion, 16% for EA and 57% for that WS students. And the black areas show, show that uh, these students uh, not, were, were still not uh, math profi proficient in math A, uh, one year after experiments end. And what's interesting about these numbers are, uh, is that uh, it's very consistent with the national data. Uh, for example, many of you may remember that the, one of the CCA publications, uh, Spanning the Divide, published in 2016, uh, they showed you know, some states' outcomes, and the numbers are very similar to this, which is very inter uh, interesting. So uh, the data and implementation information I presented so far have been published in uh, Educational Evaluation and Policy Analysis back in 2016. So if you have, this is a citation. So if you have any questions about uh, anything about this study, you can go back, go, go back to this paper or you can reach out to us or you can ask us during Q&A during this sem uh, webinar. Um, and in addition, uh, this experiment received What Works Clearinghouse without reservations rating in March 18, which is quite an honor. Uh, so now Dan is going to present uh, what's beyond this paper, a three-year result. Dan? Okay. okay. So if students don't have enough math to, if they don't have enough math to um, do well, one would expect then that they wouldn't do well in their scientific, in their science courses, in their social science courses. But what we see here is now the first bar, we would expect this, that the um, that students in the STATWS group would be more likely to complete their math and quant reasoning courses. And that's because that's the course they got as a part of the intervention. But if you look at all the lines, except for scientific world, which is nearly even, the STATWS group is outperforming the uh, business as usual group in elementary algebra. So the data seem to suggest that students have more than at, at least what they need to succeed in their other courses and perhaps more. So let's continue. Um, uh, can I have the next? Oh, there we go. Okay, but people said um, that the STATWS students will not take and pass the math courses that need, that need elementary algebra and college algebra as a prerequisite. Okay, that might be true, but, and then further, that some elementary algebra students will take elementary and college algebra and get excited by the math they learn there so that they would take more advanced math courses, but STATWS students being deprived of college and elementary algebra will not have that opportunity. So what 
do the data say about this? So here we have the math courses taken by our students since the experiment. Um, and of course, again, you see at the top, that's our experiment. More statistics work with workshop students took a statistics course. But, and then college algebra, more elementary algebra students or students assigned to the regular remedial pathway took elementary algebra. But let's look at the advanced courses, the things that people would really care about. You've got more of our students, the st statistics students, um, taking the courses from pre-calculus through linear algebra than you do in the elementary algebra group. And that's likely because of exactly what one would expect. Many of the students in elementary algebra are still mired in their remedial courses and can't move on. So the data seem to suggest that students in, who took statistics, despite not being on the traditional algebra track, once they've completed their college level math requirement, some go on to do more math. But people would say again, that students assessed as needing elementary algebra can't take and pass college algebra without passing elementary algebra first. Okay, so what did the data say? Well, we have the number of statistics students who passed their assigned courses during the experiment and later passed the college algebra course without having, to ta having taken elementary algebra and with no additional assistance. How many did that? 14. So we have quite a few students in our group. Now it's not a lot, right? It's not relative to 297. But that means that students, these students were finished with their math requirement and went back to take the course that, they, that, was, that was not necessarily on their track. These students said, okay, I want to take college algebra. Let me take it. So they still can, of course, pass college algebra without, without their remedial elementary algebra because they did. So let's go on to the next question or the next concern. People said that if you don't make students take elementary algebra, they will not be able to later change their mind and complete math intensive majors. So this is just an extension of the last question. The last question said they can't complete college algebra. Okay, but they, now we're saying they can't complete majors that would require college algebra. So that's what we could define as a math intensive major, a math major that requires college algebra. So what did the data say? These are all the, these are all the students in both of these groups who graduated within three years, which is where our data end right now, um, and in majors requiring college algebra or more. In the elementary algebra group, the control group, we had two degrees that required college algebra or more. In the statistics group, we had five degrees that required college algebra or more. So again, we're dealing with very small numbers, but within three-year three, three -year graduation rates at community colleges are relatively low, so we're still waiting for more graduation data, and stay tuned for our six-year follow-up, and we have a lot more data to compare on, math, on graduation and majors, and we're, you know, but here at least we have some suggestive evidence that says, let's continue to track this question of whether or not students in statistics continue to complete math who took statistics and got off the college algebra tech track. Let's see if they continue to complete math intensive majors. Okay, so let's move on. People would say then again, changing one course requirement won't affect graduation rates and it certainly won't increase graduation rates. Now, I believe some of this myself. I, I used to, I, I was of the mind that many early interventions, which is where a lot of higher ed policy has gone lately, focusing on what we do for students early. I was always of the mind like that you need long-term comprehensive support to affect graduation rates. Um, and that among these would be something like changing a, changing a math requirement. But um, let's look at the data, let's see. So this is a little bit of a complicated graph, but it's, or, uh, but it, it's, uh, or chart, whatever we wanna call it. Um, but if we, if we look, let's, let's, the groups are of equal size, so we don't have to worry about translating numbers from vastly different ends. Um, if you look at the top, the black and the gray, um, we have our associate's degree earners. And in the elementary algebra group, we've got 9.8 who, uh, or 10% who both earned a degree, an associate's degree, and enrolled in a bachelor's program, and another 7.5% who earned an associate's but did not enroll in a bachelor's program. Um, you've got a, a, substantial, a substantially larger proportion um, in the staff WS group in each of those categories. Almost 15% earned an associate's and moved on to a bachelor's program, and another 11% um, earned an associate's degree but did not move on. Uh, let's take the next slide. So the summary is that in the elementary algebra group, we've got 17.2% graduated, 30% still enrolled, 
and, and 52.9, just over half not enrolled. In the STATWS group, we've got just under half not enrolled, 26.5% um, 26, 26 still enrolled but not graduated, and 25.3% graduated. We can all do the math here, and we see an 8.1 percentage point difference in uh, graduation rate, and that's statistically significant, and that's what surprised me. I was like, okay, we, we did something literally at the beginning of a college student's career. We just changed one thing about their college experience. And that led to an eight percentage point uh, difference in graduation rate. That's astounding to me. Um, and if we take that percentage point difference and turn it into a percentage difference, just about 50% or 40%, 7% more statistics students graduated within three years than elementary algebra students. And that's our, our big headline finding. Um, but some people will still say, and this is a, so there's, a, there's a, a difference in our experiment. It took a D to pass statistics, but a C to pass elementary algebra. Uh, therefore, stats, some would say, was easier to pass, and the students who passed it with a D must not have done well afterwards. So we're looking at the low performing group in a, within our experiment, but what do the data say about this question? What happens to students who don't do well? Okay, so of all the elementary algebra students who earned any grade, just so long as they passed um, during the experiment, 28% graduated. So 28% of elementary algebra passers graduated. Okay, among those students in, stats, in our stats group who passed statistics but with a D, 41% of them graduated. So our, our, our lowest performing, those who did the, the least well in their statistics course, more of them graduated than uh, than the general population of elementary algebra graduates. And again, what does this mean? It means that students in stats were getting pet were past a requirement, where students who graduated elementary algebra still had to go, th or passed through elementary algebra still had to take another math requirement. So we've, we're, we're changing the pathway through community college in this way. Um, all right, still continuing, some people will say, that maybe the, st the statistics students graduated at higher rates, but they won't do as well as the algebra students after graduation because they won't have had the elementary algebra that people need for their jobs. Okay, um, uh, let's, let's think about that. Okay, we don't have, now, first of all, we don't have, uh, we don't have employment data for students yet, um, but we will. Um, and that's, that's gonna be part of our six year follow up. Um, that's one thing, but two recent studies uh, show that for the great majority of jobs, for the great majority of incumbent workers, algebra, algebra is not a required skill. In contrast, students who have, have taken statistics or having taken statistics may help, help increase women's post-graduation salaries specifically. And of the Douglas and Atwell 2017, I would know this research well, I am Beth Douglas. Um, so, uh, what I found in that research was, was quite simply that somewhere south of 5% of incumbent workers across the labor force needed, element, needed any sort of advanced math skills to do their jobs. And even if we restrict that sample to students who needed a BA to do their job, the number of students who need advanced math along the lines of algebra is 10% or less. So, we're not talking about algebra being completely diffuse in the labor force. So that argument doesn't really stand up to the evidence we have as of now. Um, so we'll take on one, a couple more things, um, the effects on performance gaps. And now this is an interesting point. So our results, our experimental results do not differ by students, race or, race or ethnicity, right? Our experiment affected all racial ethnic groups similarly, but what we know from lots of, other, lots of other research prior is that students of color are disproportionately assigned to developmental coursework, especially in math, from what I understand. Um, and so if you take those two points, logically tie them together, if you have an intervention that increases student success rates similarly across race ethnic groups, um, but addresses a phenomenon that is disproportionately affects minority students, you're going to close performance gaps because more additional students from minority groups are going to pass um, a course to which they've been assigned. So we're going to, like, 
this will have a, an ultimately a leveling effect if we can move to a co-requisite model across, um, across, across CUNY or across the community college landscape. And a last note, so if you're interested in the cost of education of the elementary and, and algebra and stats students that were randomly assigned, um, and any the, the average elementary algebra student had to take 5.2 math courses to pass his or her general education quantitative requirement. They had to take five classes, which is five unit credit units, which is five units of money. For the statistics students, that average was 2.6. We're cutting in half the number of courses a student needs to complete their quantitative requirements, which is, from a cost perspective, a really good thing. I'm going to leave it to Lexa to finish up with some concluding thoughts. Unmute. OK, thank you, Dan. Um, so uh, basically, what we see from uh, this research is that students who are assessed as needing elementary or remedial algebra and who are not majoring in a math intensive major are more likely to pass the assigned course if they take, instead of the traditional remedial course, they take college level statistics with extra support. And they're more likely to graduate, including passing college level general education, social and natural science courses and all types of math courses. And this approach can help to close performance gaps. In addition, <laughs> we can say the co-requisite math remediation works, not just because of our experiment, but because of the many, many other uh, pieces of research that have supported it, which seem to have very consistent results. So why isn't everyone using it? The uh, most recent survey that we have um, shows that in 2016, um, actually only 16% of public two-year colleges had co-requisite math. And uh, so that's a small number. We know that there have been some significant increases since 2016, but there's still a lot of people who are not, or colleges that are not using it. And there are also people who seem to not be aware that there is this great deal of data supporting co-requisite remediation. Um, and the question is, why is that so? Well, I think part of it is just that some of the research has been published in um, technical journals, it's in the What Works Clearinghouse, it's not in places that everybody would be likely to see, but that's one of the reasons why we're doing this webinar. And we're very grateful to Complete College America for asking us to do this, because in this way, we can communicate to a much broader audience about what is happening with co-requisite. And what can we all do? <laughs> we, we can we can communicate this information broadly. And uh, that basically brings us to the last slide where we say thank you. And uh, I think we have a few minutes for questions. Yes, we do. And we have some questions in the box. Um, so for anyone who is interested in asking questions, um, feel free to use your question and answer um, box at the bottom of your screen and type them in there and we will get to them in the order received. Um, the first um, is more of a comment. And so I think we're looking for um, a reaction to the comment. Um, people would say that this isn't nearly the sort of experiment originally suggested. You're comparing growth of tomato plants with growth of tomato plants with sugar pills with growth of carrots with CUNY Grow. The question of whether students are better served by taking a statistics class is a different question than whether they are better served by a co-requisite model. All right, can, um, can everybody hear me? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, it is true that we did, we did two things in, this, in our experiment. We both uh, used a co-requisite model and we also assigned students to statistics instead of a traditional algebra track. So our experiment uh, involved both of those techniques, which are two of the math, remedial math reform techniques that have been uh, very much supported by the research. But I will say that, so even though it was those two though, 
these results that we obtained were very consistent with the many citations that we presented near the beginning of the webinar of uh, the greater pass rates that you see in um, with co-requisite remediation in as compared to traditional remediation in all kinds of subjects. And some of those studies do involve algebra and not statistics. I wanted to just to add a little bit to that because um, the, again, the general theory of developmental education or, uh, or remediation is that students are unprepared for college level math without remedial math. And statistics counts as college level math um, and, or is one among many courses that counts as college level math. So in a way, like, and, and it's funny because the original, one of the, the I think in the original intention of the, of the, the experiment that we had planned was to do a co-requisite on college level algebra, but it became you know, unfeasible for, for a few reasons that Mari and Lexa would remember better than I do. Um, but the fact, I think the, 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 the debt, what we demonstrate here, despite that, the fact that it's a statistics course that is involved in the co-requisite approach is that if we take a col take students who needed, who were assigned as needing a developmental course, who were designated as unqualified for, and this was gonna to relate to the, one of the other questions on the screen, designated as unqualified for college level work in, in a quantitative course, we put them into a college level course in quantitative with a supplemental support structure, and they, out, and they outperformed. They did better, they accumulated more credits, they didn't do any worse in their social science and natural science courses, and they were just as they were just as likely, if not more likely, there were no there was no difference in likelihood of them completing math intensive majors and by a particular definition. And they were more likely to graduate by a, a substantial margin over three years. So I think we still have an important uh, we still have an important result um, that challenges the conventional wisdom that students assigned to developmental are there because they're not ready for college level quantitative work. And also, I like to make another point that. Uh, you know, traditional remediation, this is like one size fits all. Even if, you know, students' uh, majors are liberal arts or, you know, other non-math intensive majors, they were all put into elementary algebra zero credit remediation. So this, you know, uh, experiment shows that students, you know, uh, can put into college algebra that it, uh, not college algebra, I'm sorry, uh, statistics, which is more relevant for their majors and they do well. So <laughs> that's my answer. <laughs> maybe we should go to the next question. Yeah. Sure. Um, and just on, I, maybe you touched on this, but um, Connie from the Dana Center said she um, had someone made that argument last week. Um, an additional question is why not also have a stats only group in order to compare the pathways effect versus the correct effect? Thanks, I have the answer. Yeah, <laughs> so this would be students who were uh, assessed as needing uh, remedial math, but who were instead placed into college level statistics with no extra support. Um, CUNY policy did not allow us to do that. There might also be, since we didn't know um, what would happen, we couldn't convince the IRB <laughs> that that would be okay. There might have been ethical issues with doing that. Yeah, we really wanted to do it that way, but the policy didn't allow us to. Yes. Yeah. Okay, that's very, very helpful. Um, so our next question that came in was, um, who shouldn't be permitted to take a co-requisite, um, but rather be placed into a traditional remedial course? Um. I'll try it. I'll try a little bit here. Um, so the parameters of our experiment were that, um, and and this it doesn't exactly answer the question, but it goes some distance to what we had initially hypothesized. So we took students students who were eligible to be part of this experiment were only assigned to elementary algebra, to not to lower levels. They were not assigned assigned to repeat a myth arithmetic or any sort of basic math course. They weren't three levels deep like that first diagram showed. They were, one, they were at the next, they were at the last developmental course. And so, and that again, just like the lack of a stats only group was about um, doing what we, what we felt would, would potentially help, but, uh, but do the least harm if it, um, uh, 
uh, relative to what's possible. So um, who should, um, or well, who should or should not? Go ahead, Lexa. Yeah, I would say we don't have complete data on that to answer that question. We have another program at CUNY that's called CUNY Start, which is specifically designed for students who have significant, who've been assessed as having significant remedial need in all three areas, math, reading, and writing. And they go through a very different sort of experience than the co-requisite experiences. Uh, uh, they, don't, um, they don't matriculate for a semester and they have um, 25 hours of class a week. It's a very intensive experience. We're conducting a randomized controlled trial on that now, um, which is being done with MDRC. And there are some, um, and also Community College Research Center is also involved in that. Um, there are some um, results that seem to suggest that that kind of um, uh, program works best for students who really do have assessed deep, extensive remedial need. But we'll have more information in a year or two as that randomized controlled trial goes on. It may be that, um, but one thing that we do know, and I do want to stress this because it was a slide that Mari showed, was that no matter what their compass score was, the students benefited from being in the co-requisite um, stats course as opposed to being put into the elementary algebra course. So uh, these students who fail, 30%, 40% of students who fail co-rec, you know, the data show that they may not be relevant for co-rec, but we can't put them into traditional remediation that the data show, right? Then what do these students need? So that's a question. And now uh, at CUNY and elsewhere, probably Tennessee and Georgia, uh, it seems that these students who fail COREC, they fail other courses you know, they took in the same semester, meaning that it doesn't seem to be that their issue is their math skills. They may have some math you know, issues with math skills, but they probably need more comprehensive, you know, holistic support, mm -hmm. like studying skills or time management skills, mm -hmm. or maybe they're too busy, you know, so adding more hours, you know, putting them back into traditional remediation, that's not the answer. So that for sure. Um, so um, I think the, the next question is about students in pre-algebra. Um, uh, I don't know, are we there yet? Sure, go for it. The question is, do you have students who place into pre-algebra and do you have any information about that group of students? So, so as we said, um, uh, our experiment addressed students who placed into elementary algebra but not pre-algebra. I am, uh, before I moved to Trinity College, I'm, I, and I'm still working with this program, I'm, I, I'm, a re I'm a researcher at Rutgers University and I'm doing some evaluations, one of my evaluations, does work with students who've placed below elementary algebra. And for those students, we were placing them into uh, an intensive summer bridge course, but that's a self-paced self-bridge co uh, bridge course um, through, the, through the lowest level basic math pre-algebra course. Um, and what we found, which was I thought was really interesting, was that many students who placed into those courses were able to um, using the online Emporium program, uh, it's like an Alex program, were able to complete their basic math requirements within 10 hours on the program. Um, and so they were, and what we found by talking to the students was that most of them had only, had only, only had issues in a few areas of pre-algebra, things like fractions and decimals. And so that uh, remedial need in basic math may only be, from what I could see from, from the trials that I've been working on, may be confined to a few areas. And so I think one of the insights that I'm getting from my research there is that need in basic math needs to be much more carefully assessed than a single one-off placement test. You need to unpack what areas students are struggling in. And it may be the case that basic math courses um, need to be unpacked into smaller modules rather than making a student take a 14-week developmental um, basic math course. Okay, I'd like to answer that question a little bit differently. Sure. Um, which is that um, there's also a fair amount of research which suggests 
like Dan was saying, that a one-off test is not, is not the greatest way to place people, um, that those kinds of tests uh, make both overplacement and underplacement area uh, errors more often in underplacement. And that what works at least as well and sometimes better is high school GPA, even if the high school GPA is not that recent. And there's a lot of thought that the reason for that is that the high school GPA reflects how a student works over time, consistently, persistently, uh, working on different things. So that even though the high schools vary a lot in their quality and their standards, um, it can be more useful. You can predict performance better with um, high school GPA than with um, a, a test. And CUNY is itself is currently uh, does use some multiple measures, but they're multiple test measures basically, but is moving towards a model very soon where they're going to be using um, high school GPA. And in fact, that's already being done at some of the colleges to great success. Great. Okay. I think we need to move on to the next question. Um, and I think I actually can combine a few people's questions. Um, they're sort of asking the same thing about describing um, the additional support in the stats course. Um, yes. Is it the same instructor, embedded tutors within a lab? Um, just sort of talk about that, including how many credit hours. That's definitely a Mari answer. Sure. So uh, these courses, uh, M into algebra or statistics, used as a base are pre-existing courses and we added to our workshops as i mentioned you know led by peer leaders and we trained them and supervised them these peer leaders attended all the class meetings you know and uh they discussed with instructors you know the weaknesses of the students what students need and then during the uh, workshops, they, uh, what they did was totally up to the students. You know, of course, instructors and uh, peer, le peer, peer leaders, they had you know, some materials, but if the students said that we didn't understand this, we want to do this, you know, they did that. So it was a uh, uh, totally student-centered model. And as I mentioned, it was a two hour weekly workshops and they didn't receive any equated credits or credits for that portion. And uh, they didn't pay for that either. And peer leaders, they got paid $13 per hour. And uh, as I mentioned, they attended uh, all the class meetings. So they worked about uh, six to eight hours per week. Uh, one thing uh, everyone did during the workshop is at the beginning, there was a reflection uh, worksheet. Students answered what they studied and what they learned in the last class meeting, what they didn't understand. And you know, based on that, they designed their own workshop. Okay, so as, as Mari outlined, this was actually um, financially a very uh, effective way a very efficient way to do the co-requisite. Okay. So we do have somebody that came in next with a comment about California's multiple measures project. Um, and I think that you already spoke to that, Dr. Logue, um, and acknowledged the multiple measures and the um, using GPA. So I'm going to um, acknowledge that that comment was placed in here um, and move to the next question. Um, is there a correlation between students who fail co-requisite and any of the math-specific assessment metrics? Well, they were, they were more likely to not pass if they had lower compass scores. I mean, that was, that was the graph that Mari showed. Okay. How are the results of co-requisites um, on the STEM side of mathematics? So our students were not STEM students. So well, they didn't intend to be at, at the outset. Yeah, yeah. And, I, I, and Mara, you want to say something? Sure. So how we, except probably you remember, it's a long time ago, but the reason why we decided to choose uh, 
stats as a co-requisite, you know, part is uh, that at CUNY, majority of students are non STEM majors. They don't, they're not required to take college algebra. About, you know, it, it varies across colleges, but about 70, 80 students, percent of students, you know, they need either uh, stats or QR as a gateway math course. So that's, that's why we picked right. it. Yeah. That's why we picked it. And we, um, we try to be very careful in extending our own results that we did not use students who intended to be STEM majors or to have, who intended majors with college algebra. But there is a great deal of evidence in other studies that seems to show consistently that if you're giving students support in a college level course, they do better than being put into a standalone prerequisite remedial course. At CUNY, there are a couple of colleges who are doing college algebra correct. Yes. And they're having success with it, but we can't, we don't have the data at our fingertips. Okay, great. Um, so a question. Um, so you haven't found any common characteristics in the students who did not pass that could be used to pre-identify. Um, oh. Did you look at that in your research at all? So I think our data do permit us to look at um, uh, the, the characteristics of students who didn't pass. It's not something that we've done at this point, um, except to say that, um, and this was one of the slides, that the benefit, the difference between um, co-rec and the control group um, was fairly was fairly uniform across the distribution of math scores which I feel like is an important predictor of success um, which is to say that the bump you got from co-rec you get from co-rec existed no matter where you were on that spectrum um, and so who should not take co-rec the diagram actually says everyone benefits um, that there wasn't some point on the compass spectrum, at least in the, again, within the parameters we set on the experiment, right, which was that student needed to be assigned to elementary algebra and not anything below that, right? It says that everywhere on the elementary algebra spectrum in which we allowed, and I would consult the paper for the, for the specifics on the compass score, um, everywhere within that spectrum, students got the benefit. Okay, and that is something that, again, um, we have somebody that brought up the M, um, the multiple measures work in California and said that it, um, the comment was not to focus on GPA, but to focus on the fact that no group of students, regardless of GPA or area of study, um, STEM, for example, were better off taking traditional remediation versus COREC. Um, and I think you all touched on that a few times. Um, Question, do the students perceive the workshop sessions to be mandatory? Um, were there grade consequences tied to the workshop sessions? Okay, Mari. Uh, yes, we were okay. clear that uh, the workshop to the students that the workshops were mandatory. Of course, the attendance rates were not 100%, but that was the same for the class meetings. And uh, even though students knew that it was mandatory, you know, they missed you know, workshops here and there. But as I mentioned, you know, attendance rates for uh, STAT WS for workshops was higher, statistically higher than EAWS. Okay, one more quick question. Um, is anybody at CUNY using Alex for placement? No, I don't know the answer to that. I don't think so, oh, no. Yeah. Right, that's helpful. Um, so I'm going to um, throw it back to Bruce um, for some final comments. Um, but thank you all for answering all the questions. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, uh, Vanessa, as well. And thank you, of course, Lexa, Dan, and Mari for your presentation. Uh, this presentation has been recorded. And we're going to put up a version of that on our website very, very soon. Uh, I do encourage you to go to the Complete College website for a full range of resources related to co-requisite support, including this webinar, uh, and encourage you to develop a profile there where you can get access, full access to all of our resources related to co-requisite and all of our game changers. I did want to make a couple closing comments. Um, 
while of course the CCRC research is showing that there's limited adoption of co-requisites maybe nationally, we are seeing tremendous momentum across states. CCA has identified at least 19 states, many of which we're working with very, very closely to not only adopt and implement, but scale co-requisite for the vast majority of students. States like Georgia, Tennessee, West Virginia have already scaled co-requisites for virtually all of their students and do not have a floor that is a point where students would be placed into developmental education as opposed to a co-requisite. And the results from those states are nothing short of astounding with dramatic increases for students at all levels. In fact, research in Tennessee has found that students are 10 times more likely to pass a co-requisite math course when they have ACT scores of 13 below than were the than when they were placed in developmental education. So students even at the lowest levels of assessments are still, still doing quite well in co-requisites. Likewise, I think we did mention the research in California that shows that their significant analysis of their data shows that there's really no point where students um, would be better off in developmental education. We're not ready to say that developmental education necessarily works quote unquote for all students, but what we do know is that academic measures of readiness seem to not be able to predict whether or not a student can or cannot be successful in co-requisites. I point you to some of the work that's been done in Tennessee and in Georgia, which shows that other factors, uh, not having to do with academic assessments, but broader assessments of student readiness for college academic mindset seem to have a little bit more predictability in determining whether or not a student is successful in co-requisites and frankly predicts whether or not students are successful in college at all. In other words, students with low academic mindset assessments are usually unsuccessful in all their college level work, whereas students who are successful in co-requisites, generally speaking, are successful in all their courses, which of course was verified through the research done by Lexa, Dan, and Mari. So we definitely encourage you to continue to look at the research. There's more emerging all the time. We do appreciate your participation in today's webinar. Like I mentioned, we will be posting this very shortly on the CCA website. Uh, thanks again to Lexa, Dan, and Mari. And uh, we look forward to continually working with all of you uh, on this very important issue. Thanks and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.